डॉक्टर फातिमा जवाद इज द चीफ एडिटर ऑफ जे पी एम ए जर्नल ऑफ पाकिस्तान मेडिकल दिस जर्नल इज वन ऑफ दिस जर्नल ऑफ द पाकिस्तान हाइस्ट इम्पैक्ट फैक्टर एंड डॉक्टर फातिमा जवाद इज नॉट ओनली द नेशनल बट आल्सो इंटरनेशनल टीचर एंड शी हैज ए लॉट ऑफ वेबिनार्स and uh, physical webinars uh, and contact sessions nationally and internationally we are lucky dr fatima uh, thank you very much uh, you gave the time and especially so many people uh, from azad jammu kashmir medical college muzaffarabad and other people requested me professor mulazim why not you conduct this uh, important sessions dr fatima janab uh, jawad now it is over to you assalam alaikum everyone everyone thank you वालेकुम Uh, hadith from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib: The most complete gift of God is life based on knowledge. And I think we all try to follow this. We all agree with this. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Professor Salma Kundi, Dr. Kazi Basik, and Dr. Mulazim for inviting me for this webinar. And as Dr. Mulazim has just stated, that the topic is very important especially for our junior colleagues who are in, um, in the teaching um, institutions and they have to perform research and they have to teach research to the juniors so i've tried my best to get everything together we'll have it uh, we'll have a discussion for one hour and i hope i can convey some good material to you So this is what our journal looks like. It is called the Journal of Pakistan Medical Association, and it is a leading monthly journal with all biomedical articles in it. It is a peer-reviewed journal with an impact factor of zero point seven eight one. We have been indexed with Index Medicans, Index Medicals since nineteen seventy-five. Now the question comes to the mind that what is research? It was in the year fifteen seventy seven that the French people they defined research they uh, as to go about seeking. We also know that when we add the word re r e to a word, it means doing it again. So it means you search again. Research is actually a quest for something new, but there are some requirements. Not everybody can do research. You need to have an inquisitive mind. and it deals with collecting knowledge of the past and then you have to add something new to it what is going on today but there is a basic responsibility for performing research and that is that responsibility it starts from conceiving the idea of shaping the idea and then conducting the research and then eventually you get the results and finally after you got the results you have to get it published which is an which is absolutely obligatory so then many people ask why should we write research we've done the research we've got the results and why should we write them in scientific journals and the reason is that you want to disseminate whatever your knowledge you have increased or the results you have got to the large community of scientists and whatever the pool of knowledge has been there you add something to it and this information will help others to interpret their own results so it is an obligation on the researcher they must write down the research no matter even if it is with negative results there is an effective method of writing the research first of all if the research is well done then you can write it well if it is not well done you will have problems you have to have a clear objective with a well defined hypothesis i mean you must know what are you going to research on what what is your uh, hypothesis you have read a lot and then you decide for example 
you decide that if you are going to eat more vegetables, you will lose weight. This is your hypothesis. So then you're going to research on that. But if you do not have a clear, well-defined hypothesis, the research will all be jumbled. You have to have very accurate steps of research. The data collection has to be very exact and the analysis has to be professional. Now we know the statistical analysis is being done in every teaching institution. And how are we going to work effectively? What is desired is that you have to have honesty and you have to be ethical. And this is important. You have to follow all the rules. All the aspects of the research should be discussed at the beginning of the project with your co-researchers. It should be decided before you start the research. There should be no uh, decisions later on going on changing the status of the authors, who is going to be the first and who is going to be the last. All this should be decided before you even start the research. And finally, all the authors should read and approve the final version. Sometimes we get articles and one of or two of the authors say we don't even know what was the version. That is unethical. So what is ethical writing? You have to write honestly all the, the research results you have got. There should be no plagiarism, no copying, cutting and pasting, no falsification or fabrication. This happens when your results are not what you expected and then you make changes in that. That is not allowed. You have to be honest. You have to publish your results, whatever you have acquired. No duplicate submission for publication. When people are in such a hurry, they'll send the same articles to two journals. There should be no conflict of interest, appropriate authorship and acknowledgements where it is necessary. And why should ethics be observed? Because if you do not observe ethics, it is misconduct. It amounts to deception, dishonesty, or negligence. And naturally, this is not acceptable in any society. There can be serious um, implications of misconduct if you're caught. The article can be retracted. Now, just remember, if an article is retracted, it, it does not mean that the world will not know. The article is not removed from the website or from PubMed, but there is a big notice there that this article has been retracted for these reasons. And they have, the article has a watermark on it. So it's there for life. The authors can be debarred. The journal will not take any more articles from these authors. The head of the institution and the regulatory bodies as the PMDC and HEC, they will be informed. Promotion can be barred. There will be a barrier to the promotion. These are the various types of medical writing. I will not go into all because we are going to talk about writing a research article. Now, an original article or a research article. They are cousins, but there's a difference between the two. One time there was the Higher Education Commission that wanted original articles for, um, for promotion. And we had a lot of difficulty in telling our authors that it's exactly the same, but with, with the two names. So I'll just tell you what the difference is. See, original articles, studies which are RCTs, randomized controlled trials, which have, have a trial registration in prospect, prospective registration. This is an original article. All epidemiological studies, they can, uh, in which new cases may be studied, and the prevalence studies or the incident studies, they are from all over the country. These are original articles. Then descriptive observation studies, they can be cohort, case control, and cross-section. I mean, if they fall into this group, they are original articles. And research articles, these are, uh, single center studies done to determine a new management or investigation aspect of a disorder. So when you're working in your own institution, in one hospital or maybe two hospitals in your area, you're getting patients from there, you've done a research on that, that will be taken as a research article. 
the research article reports the results of original research. Now this research can be prospective or retrospective. You can take out your well-maintained files. You can take the data from these files and write your article, or you can work in prospect. You start today and you go on working for another one year, collect the data and then write the article. You have to use a standard protocol and the uniform requirements which are provided by the ICMJE. Here you can see the websites where you have the uniform requirements by the ICMJE. You go into the website, you will get everything. Now the equator guidelines, they give you, there are various guidelines for different types of studies. And here you can see that if you, uh, the strobe studies are used for research articles. This is what the equator guideline website looks like. You can just go into it, it's free of cost, and you get the guidelines for your study, and you work accordingly. This is what the strobe checklist looks like. They give you a checklist, and you have to follow the checklist and write accordingly. Now, the structure of a research article, in short, which is called IMRAD, I stands for introduction. This is followed by methods, results, and discussion. And before the introduction comes the title and the abstract. And after the discussion comes the acknowledgements, disclaimer, conflict of interest, funding source, and the last the references. So we go into all this in detail that you all understand how paper should be written. You have a good be short, as big and repeat. Give the full information what you are going to write on. All the elements of the paper should be there, no abbreviations in the title. I'll just describe to you what all this means. This is an article which was published in our journal. So you see, this is the title Effect of Peter Rack on Post Operative pain relief and dental extraction. And from this title, you can know what you're going to do. You're going to see the effect of this drug on post-operative pain in dental extraction. So now we see that the uh, title is short. There are full 19 words in the title, which is describing everything, giving the full information and which is retrievable. So, this title is followed by a short, by the abstract. Now, what is the abstract? The abstract is a short synopsis that precedes the text of the journal article. This is actually a critical window and you can see what the article is about, what is its scope and what is the significant findings. It gives enough information to make it as a useful reference. Mostly, the readers, they go into the abstract. Naturally, one is looking for some material. They are not going to read the whole article first. So, they are going to decide after reading the abstract that they want the whole article or not. Because in some journals or even journals, they only have the abstract with the title on it. And in conference proceedings, only the abstract is published, not the whole paper. So, to, uh, the reader gets a very good idea what this research is about. Sometimes when you're asking a person to peer review the article, then they want to read the abstract first before they decide they can review it or not. And sometimes this is remembered most by the readers, if it is an attractive paper, they can uh, read it and remember it for a long time. They know what the article is about. And for many people, they do not read the whole paper. Abstract is the most important aspect. And so you know what the rest of the article is about. There are certain things which you have to avoid in the abstract. <clears throat> do not write incomplete sentences. Do not write something in the abstract which is not there in the text. The abstract is not going to have any figures or tables. There will be no references in the abstract. There's going to be no lengthy background information. 
and do not use abbreviations or terms which are going to cause confusion. And do not be biased. Do not report only the favorable results. You have to give all the negative results also if there are any. Abstracts can be of two types, structured and unstructured. Uh, the journal in question decides what type of abstract is the author supposed to submit. In our journal, we ask for a structured abstract for research articles and for short reports or case reports, we ask for an unstructured report, uh, abstract. But even if it is unstructured, that means there are no subheadings in it, but you follow the logical sequence. That means you start with briefly that what is the purpose of the study? How did you do the study? What was the design? What were your major findings or the results? And what did you interpret from the results, which is the conclusion? And it is 151, so you have to be very precise in writing. A structured abstract is going to have these four subheadings, objective, methods, results, and conclusion. And the word count is 250. So in the objective, in the structured abstract, you state the precise objective of the study. And in the method, you have to give the study design. Where was it conducted? In the institution or in the community or in the hospital? You have to give the time period of the study. You have to give the number of patients who were included or the subjects who were studied on or if not on in the lab, a material study. How were the participants selected? And then how was the study carried out? How, how was the results acquired? What were the analytical methods? And what were the research instruments used? So the main findings with specific effect sizes will be in the results. You'll have to give the statistical significance if any has been acquired. And even if they're negative findings, you should be reporting them. The last is the conclusion. The conclusion should support the findings of the results and how you can apply it in clinical practice. Do not over-interpret the findings. And some people, sometimes the authors get very excited and they write too much. This is followed by mesh words. This is medical subject headings. And these mesh words have been designed by the National Library of Medicine in USA and they help in searching the database for journal citations. So if you want your article to be cited, then you must have the, these mesh keywords. I'll just give you an example to make it everything, make this clear to you. Uh, the same study which we took the title of, has come to the objective to compare the analgesic efficacy and side effects of ketorolac with pethidine in a daycare procedure. So you have to use command, command words. You write like what you did. And you see that what was the purpose of your study. And you wanted to compare the analgesic efficacy and side effects between two drugs. Now, the method of the abstract stated, a double-blind matched case control study was conducted from May to June 2003 at this university. 60 patients were divided into two equal groups, A and B, who received a single dose of either ketorolac 30 milligrams or pethidine 0.8 milligrams per kilogram body weight, both IV respectively, at the time of induction of general anesthesia. Patients were assessed in the recovery room for pain according to visual analog scale, and any side effects, amount of rescue analgesia required by both groups were recorded, odds ratio and chi square test were used for statistical analysis. Given the study design is there, double blind. When was the study conducted? The time period is there, where the university hospital is given, on whom was the study, and the number of patients that is given, the dose of the drug is given. What is the research instrument that is given? And how was it me measured by the visual analog scale? And then how did you analyze it? So this is a perfect abstract, which is giving all the information. The results, 
they showed the statistical analysis showed no significant differences between the two drugs at any time interval. However, a significantly decreased incidence of nausea and drowsiness was found in the keto relax group. So this gives the main findings of the study and this gives the negative findings that this drug led to nausea and drowsiness higher decreased incidence of nausea or the found in the other group or the higher incidence. So the conclusion says that ketorolac 30 milligram IV provides similar energy safe effects as pethidine with a less incidence of nausea and drowsiness. So this is very precise and this is honest. There are three keywords from the mesh keywords. The abstract is followed by the introduction of the topic. Now, introduction of the subject, because you want to first write that what is already known on this subject, and then you're going to report your findings. You have to summarize the problem under discussion, and you have to discuss it in the light of the literature, which is already available. So the questions which have to be answered is, what was I studying? What do we know about this before the study? And how is this study going to enhance our knowledge? The introduction is written as an inverted triangle. The base carries the most general information. This is about the topic, what, you, what is under discussion. And apex is the specific problem which you are going to study. So you have to begin with sentences focusing the topic established by a review of pertinent literature. You have to read before you write. So you have read the literature, you know what the, uh, the topic is, and you begin at the top. The introduction begins with introducing the subjects. The end, you have to give the purpose of your study and the scientific merits. Why are you doing the study? If you are using a new methodology, it has to be given. And you have to say why it is better than the older methodology. This is the example of the same article. Pain specifically, third molar extraction is said to be one of the most acute post surgical painful conditions. Now, you just see that this statement has not been made by the author, but it is referenced. You have to give the reference that who established this fact that dental pain was a very painful condition. So a third molar dental extraction model has been used previously by many researchers during the last two decades. Now in the last 20 years then we use, we have got one to six articles who have written on it to see the efficacy. And despite a massive expansion and diversification in clinical practice over recent years, the surgical removal of impacted third molar continues to be the most common procedure performed by oral and maxillo patient surgeons. So this is how we are now coming to the point that why we want to do this study. So because of that reason, the study was designed to compare the energetic effect, efficacy of ketorolac with pethidine for post-operative pain relief and the side effects in patients undergoing surgical extraction of third molar teeth. So I think this is the objective, the first three lines. And this is the specific problem. That what was the objective of the study for which specific problem, which is quite clearly written. And <clears throat> you should try and write in this way, in exact words, proper language, and not too much of, uh, it's very well clear to the reader. Now we come to the section following the introduction is the methods. This is the most critical section of the manuscript because it is going to tell us how was the study carried out <clears throat> and what was exactly done. Now I'll tell you that this is a very right saying that the paper will sink or swim on the strength of its method section. If the methods are not well written, the paper can be rejected. You say, how was methods will tell us how was the study carried out? Subjects used or patients used? Where was the study done? When was the study done? What was the design of the study? 
how was the data collected, what protocol was used, how was the data analyzed. So you have to write in a very friendly manner. Don't write long sentences and do not repeat what has already been written earlier in your paper. And don't write huge, big, ambiguous terms just to impress the reader or maybe the peer reviewer or editor. It doesn't help. How is this section labeled? We call it material and methods when you're using material. For instance, you're using lab testing material. Then to study on that. Patients and methods, if you're your study population are patients, we call it patients and methods. If the study population are healthy individuals, then we call it subjects and methods. So a good methodology should have sufficient details to help others to replicate study. Whatever you have done, it can be done by others also. And if, if you have already, or, or somebody else has already used this method, then you can still use it, but you don't have to write the, all the details, then you can just refer to it and give the reference. This is allowed. When you're writing the method, you should begin with the ethical guidelines of Helsinki Declaration in 1975. And the study, for instance, the studies on human subjects, then you start with the IRB approval and the written and informed consent of the patients who were included in the study. If the animals, if they're animal studies, then you use the approval of the concerned board. So today's, this is the article we have, we've been discussing today, a little while back. You see the methodology, uh, the style, is descriptive, and the active voice and third person. After approval from the Human Subjects Protection Committee of the hospital and patient's consent, then it goes on. Use the past tense because the study has already been done. So we say 60 patients were included. Then you have to describe the site of the study. So it was a daycare setting in a teaching hospital. You normally they give the name. How was the sample site calculated? You have to give method how it was calculated with the supporting reference. Describe the experimental design, controls, variable, and treatment, whether it was double time, single dose. This was case map. This was the study under consideration. Sample size calculation. Many people missed that out. And this is very important. They need different methods of sample size calculation. One formula cannot be used for all designs. You can consult or take help from your statistician. We have all these different methods or different tools available, WHO, OpenEPI, G-Power. And if the sample size is not calculated, the power of the study can be weakened. So it is very important. The sample size must be calculated for doing a study. Then we have the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And here in this study, as they said, only ASA 1, 2, and 3 patients of 14 to 50 years of age or two or more third molar extraction with at least one mandibular molar were included in the study. So they given all the factors which were the inclusion criteria. Exclusion criteria, patients with a history of acid peptic disease, asthma, hemorrhagic diathesis, renal impairments, known hypersensitivity to NSAIDs, concurrent treatment with NSAID. <laughs> When they gave the study protocol, all the methods were described, ketorolac, pethidine given IV, the dose was given 30 milligrams for ketorolac and 0.8 milligrams per kilogram for pethidine. The VAS or the visual analog scale for pain, it was used for assessment and the side effects were noted. It gave the site of the study, which was the daycare setting in a teaching hospital and the period of the study. They gave the pre-medication in the operating room. They, they had the non-invasive blood pressure pulse oximetry and capnography were used for every patient 
They gave the anesthesia technique. It was induced with propofol at procurium for intubation. Anesthesia maintained at procurium and isoflurane. Local anesthesia with 2% lignocaine. At the end of the surgery, neostigmine and apnea. This was all, everything, every step was described. And then what they did in the recovery room, and they continued monitoring for four hours. And then they gave pethidine, was given as a rescue analgesia, and the adverse events were noted down. If there was excessive bleeding, they find a soakage of four into four balls. It was changed every half an hour, this was recorded. So as you can see, all the details which are required, they're given very briefly and the reader can understand what was exactly done. Which statistical to tool was used? They used the SPSS version 19 for analysis. And what power tool was used? And you have to consult a statistician. I mean, we all don't know much of this. And which tests were employed? Odds ratio, chi-square test for side effects, odds ratio for rescue analgesia. And then you have to summarize your results with means and percentage of whether there's going to be a stand, with the standard deviation and standard error of means. Then we come to the next section, which is the results. And the results are going to give us the, the key findings of your research or your study. You have to describe what you found. You have to write in the same sequence as methods follow the sequence of the questions which are investigated then. First, you have to have the demographic features. You give the age, gender, the relevant data to describe the population and the demographics. Then we have the response rate, outcome of the primary variable, outcome of the secondary variable. So if you go in that order, you get your results written down very precisely. You don't miss out anything and you don't unnecessarily use more space. So you have to only have use the representative result. That means the, the results which are which you wanted, what you were studying, were looking for. And because these will then be discussed. Do not hide data. Sometimes there's a negative result. Uh, no, this is for the, you have too much, too many results. What you do is you take only half of them and the other half you make another article. This is called salami slicing. Subheadings are usually not used unless it is absolutely necessary. You have to write in clear language, simple language. You can use tables to summarize a large amount of data and uh, just refer to the tables. But only you use them when it is essential. And every journal permits a certain number of tables. For instance, we permit in a research article, there can only be three tables or figures total. This is the table which we see of this article under discussion. This is the age and with the standard deviation. This is the sex ratio. You have to prepare the graphs and tables first before you start writing the results. It makes it very significant. And the figures and tables should be such that by just reading them or looking at them, you should the reader should understand what is in the results. And if you have a dispersion of the data, then you have to give it as a graph. And you use brief and descriptive legends or captions for the tables and the graphs. The legends uh, for figures Got it. Got it. are given below the table. And for diff if they're legends and you want to describe something, for instance, you use some uh, it's written HP, then you describe that as hemoglobin below the table. For differences and significance, you have a separate column with the p values, which will give the significance. And each table and each figure should be mentioned in the results section. The Tables and figures are assigned numbers separately. You can't go table one and then comes in a figure, so you call it figure two. If there are two tables, it will be one. table one and table two. If there are two figures, it will be figure one and figure two. The legends of the table or the captions will go above the table 
and in the figure, it will be written below the figure. When you are referring to a figure in the text, you will write it as FIG, that is the abbreviation. But the table, you have to write the full table, it is not abbreviated. And all the number of tables and figures, they have to be mentioned or referred in the text. This is the demographic data of this article. This is another table which is going, giving the mean pain sc uh, score. And this is the rescue energies here. This is the comparison of the side effects of the two drugs. So they said that the need for rescue energies here at immediate half hour one, two, three, and four hours after arrival in the recovery room showed no significant difference. And after seeing the tables, we could see that. And the side effects showed that only nausea and excessive drowsiness were significantly higher in the pethidine group as compared to the keto relax group. What should be avoided in the results? Do not repeat the values from each table and figure in the text. As we just saw, that uh, they only mentioned generally that it was the rescue and, and GCR was required in very few patients or those who were, who were being given pethidine. They did not give the values which were given in the tables. Only focus on the key results which each conveys. You don't, don't have to go into each and every result. And of course, do not present the same data in the table and figure form. And do not report raw data. You have to finally process the data and then they use the final, the means and the percentages. While uh, doing your paper, do not use many colors, it becomes difficult for the journal. And if you have colors, it should be clear. Do not manipulate images. This is unethical. And if you're caught, there can be very serious repercussions. You have to write the results in the past tense, be brief, write concisely. Uh, do not write whole sentences for statistical result. That means if the p-value is given, do not use the word significant. You must report negative results. They are important because they will help to interpret your work done. The results are followed by the discussion. And the discussion, the objective or the function of the discussion is to interpret your results in the light of what is already known on the subject. And if you have discovered something new or there's a new understanding of the problem that will be in your result that will be discussed. The discussion is written as an inverted triangle. The base is at the top coming to the apex, which will be the specific reply. So you begin with the statement of principal findings, <clears throat> what your results gave you. You give the strength and weaknesses of the study, if any. Then you compare your studies with other studies. And is there any implication for the readers? Are there any questions which still remain unanswered? The first paragraph can serve as a mini abstract and this, you begin with that. You can just restate the main questions, and this will give you an indication of the conclusion you're going to draw. For instance, they said post-operative pain control is one of the most important aspects management of surgical patients. Various drugs are used, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and opioids. So this is how you begin your discussion for this article. And then you have to have a fresh angle at this point. This was known. So to avoid the dose-related side effects of narcotics, use of NSAIDs has become popular for mild to moderate post-operative pain. You see these three lines, they are leading us somewhere. We want to avoid narcotics for pain and we are thinking of NSAIDs. So we have to see what side effects the NSAIDs are going to have. And they're talking about Ketorolag, which is a NSAID which has been compared and found effective with pethidine with lesser side effects. So you summarize the principal findings of your study. So you said in our study, the drug was given at induction, pain score was evaluated after arriving in the recovery room after four hours intervals. 
and peak pain intensity in our study was at one hour. Now this is compared with other studies. You use other studies whether your results are better or their results were better and you have to reference the other studies which are used. We discussed in the same sequence. Energetic effect, side effects and rest. This was a sequence that was used in the study. So we begin with the energetic effects, what were the side effects and how much rescue analgesia was used. What you should avoid is do not restate the entire results in detail. You're not going to repeat all of it. And you can just add few results or you bridge sentences. Do not add new results in the discussion. If the journal allows or if it is necessary, you can use subheadings. Now, strength and weaknesses of, there are in every study, so you have to be honest. If you have any weaknesses of the study, you just mention it. You can call it limitation or weakness. For example, if the sample size was small, obviously the results are not going to be very exciting. So you say the sample size was small for this reason. All the required investigations were not available. You can see that MRI was not available in the institute, so it was not done. If you have any strengths, you can state that. All the subjects were followed up with no fallouts. This is a strength. You have to compare with other studies. Uh, relate your work to the finding of other studies. Discuss the differences with, in the results of other studies and with your results, along with the strengths and weaknesses. For instance, Olmedo et al., we gave the reference, found no difference in pain intensity between the drug and the placebo groups at 8, 24, and 40 hour, 8 hours interval. So you compare it with your study. You have to understand the hypothesis. How could the results of other studies combined with yours give a better understanding of the problem? So you have to write on that. As for instance, this key to relax, you say that just minimal anti-inflammatory and anti-pyretic activity at energetic doses, small doses, which is also a potent platelet aggregation inhibitor, which is not an anesthetic agent and possesses no sedative or anxiolytic properties. Briefly mention any intended further studies to clarify your hypothesis. This is not necessary, but if you have the intention, it should be mentioned. Now, readers are very important. Just keep this in mind. Because sometimes when some wrong results are missed out and published, or sometimes the peer reviewer misses that. Sometimes the editor misses that. And the article gets published. Even after 10 years, a reader can comment on it and the article can be retracted. We have retracted two articles last year and we have put up a notice of concern on one article this year and three articles are still in process, which have been published and you have, uh, people have written on that. Readers, they do interpret, so you have to understand that. Just if your article is published, it doesn't mean it is going to be there forever. Do not intermingle results with discussion because it confuses the reader. Do not have too much of right, simple, right, simple language and in a simple manner. Well, that is the best, that is the beauty. Do not suggest future research, only if it is very necessary or very pertinent. Everybody is very fond of writing that more studies should be done. Only give specific recommendations. You are not a very, I mean, every person, every author is not a very high five researcher. 200 researchers, it's very easy to say, then do this, do that, don't do that. If there are no recommendations, just don't say anything, it's not necessary. What you should not include in the dis uh, discussion, do not write on any aspect which your data does not support. Do not claim to be the first, this is very common. This is the first study done in Pakistan. I mean, you may have missed out many studies. All the journals, their websites are not very good. They're not approachable. Do not ramble. Write in clear language. 
and tables and figures should be avoided. We do not have too many tables and figures. Whatever is given in the tables and figures, do not repeat everything in the introduction methodology. Do not review the literature other than review that is necessary to place. And what you, your, your article needs or requires or desires, just take those results of other articles. And to try and take in the latest articles, not always 25 year old articles. So in conclusion of the article, this is the last paragraph of the study. So what this is linked to the objective and the inference is drawn. Explain the importance of the study or relevance. You have to give the take home points. Now the conclusion is a very brief paragraph, so you cannot write too much in it. You have to be very precise. Just write the very important points, what you have, what you have in your results, what you sort of deducted in your results. And you write that and the long conclusion it becomes all bizarre and it's not to the point. Avoid unqualified statements and conclusions which have not been supported by your data. Do not um, make any statements on economic benefits and costs unless the manuscript includes the appropriate economic data and analysis. Do not presume. And avoid claiming priority or alluding to work that has not been completed. Do not state any new hypothesis. And you have to be very precise in the conclusion. You cannot write anything extra in the conclusion. This is the conclusion of this study which we were discussing. It is concluded that Ketorolac is a useful alternative to opioid and to other non steroidal analgesics in ameliorating moderate to severe post-surgical pain. It's brief to the point, and we know what the study results gave us. And that was the conclusion. Conclusion is followed by the acknowledgement section. And now we should know that who is to be acknowledged. Now, all those who helped in the study. If you read the ICM, ICM JE guidelines for the authorship criteria, so everybody cannot be the uh, authors, but people have helped you. Maybe you took help from a colleague to design the study and you really got help, you can acknowledge that colleague. You got cases, say, from other wards, you can uh, acknowledge the physician who referred the cases. You got many tests done in the laboratory, you acknowledge the laboratory. The statisticians for the statistical tests, you ask somebody to type your article, the secretarial help. Then before you send your paper to any journal, you submitted it, you ask some expert friends to go through it and give suggestions, you can acknowledge them. Any source of funding for supporting the research that has to be mentioned. And the acknowledgement is placed between the discussion and the references. Just before you start the references, you place them. At the end, you have to put a disclosure. If you have already presented the the study at the conference, then you have to write that presented at this conference this year, name of the conference, and the abstract book. You have to give the abstract number and the page number of the book. If there are any conflict of interest, you have to write that. For instance, the sometimes is the head of the IRB is also the also an author, and you have to write that. Any financial support has to be acknowledged. Now, just remember that publication ethics are essential. So, follow the rules, don't break the rules. Plagiarism is not tolerated because now it is very easily detected with modern software. We are, all the journal officers are using these turn it in. Be honest with the authorship because sometimes after publication, then this author start writing, my name was not there. My name is in the last, it should be at the first and things like that. That is not going to be looked into. And just remember that good work is always rewarded. And also this is important that good articles are not written, but they are rewritten. So you have to keep on writing. You write it once and then you put it away for one or two days and then you start again. And you see how many mistakes you have made. 
because they have to be rewritten and rewritten. Time should be available for concentration and reading. You cannot do research or write research in a hurry. And secondly, perseverance is the key to success. And if you have made mistakes, you do it, start all over again. If somebody has pointed out a mistake, you can do it, you start writing. This is, I mean, don't think that once you have written, the article is perfect. And this is very true that Samuel Johnson said, what is written without efforts is generally read without pleasure. So you have to work hard. You have to make efforts before you get your results. So it was real pleasure being with all of you. And if there are any questions, I'm there to answer. I would uh, like to ask myself, what is the now new criteria of plagiarism? How much uh, copying is been uh, allowed in the article and in thesis and something else? Okay, uh, in our journal we permit twenty percent overlapping, but there are some journals which go less. I mean, they say ten percent or fifteen percent. The overlapping sometimes, you know, if you have taken uh, exactly the words from, I and mean, you put them in inverted commas, and you have uh, sort of given the source, then that overlapping is permitted. But on the whole, we don't allow more than 20%.